Okay, uh, good evening and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you are here for the Living with Wildlife seminar series, and uh, we are featuring today Dr. John Organ, who will be talking about the North American model for wildlife conservation. But before we get to that, I would like to first just take a few moments to introduce the series and to, get, to go through some acknowledgements. So again, this is the Living with Wildlife seminar series. Uh, this is a series that is part of the Wildlife 150 course at UWSP. And this is a course that is offered to all UWSP students that are interested in learning more about wildlife conservation and wildlife management and human wildlife interactions. Um, so this is a course that is hosted, or I'm sorry, taught by Dr. Scott Hingstrom and Dr. Katie Sartini. And so I'd like to thank them for putting this seminar series together. We have two other presentations in this seminar series coming up, and they were both in April. And you can see more information about that series at Wisconsin. At, um, www.uwsp slash WCW, or you can Google Wisconsin Center for Wildlife and you can find more information about those seminars there. Uh, there will be, uh, one will be featuring Adrian Weidevin, who will be talking about living with wolves in Wisconsin, and another will be with our own Brylin Brecka, who will be talking about grassland management in Wisconsin. Um, and so again, thank you to Scott and Katie for putting this together. And Anytime UWSP has a public facing seminar or event, we like to go through this acknowledgement and virtual gatherings count. So I'd like to take a moment. Uh, we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to, to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Scott Hingstrom, and he will do the uh, and he will introduce our speaker today. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and I welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to see all of you here. And I, I that last count, I saw we were over 100 already, and I think the number is growing. So it's it's a fantastic group to have online here today. Um, I'm Dr. Scott Hingstrom. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife here at UW Stevens Point, and and it is my honor to introduce John Organ today. Um, Dr. John Morgan has a very distinguished past. Um, he was a former chief of the USGS Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Units. He's a former chief of the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program for the Northeast region of the US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. He earned his PhD in wildlife and fisheries biology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And he's currently an adjunct associate professor at UMass, Michigan State, the University of Dodd, Andres Bello in Santiago, Chile, and where he supervises and co-advises three PhD and three master's students. He's a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society and is a past president, fellow, and honorary member of TWS. He is an associate editor of the Journal of Human Dimensions of Wildlife. He's a professional member of the Boone and Crockett Club and is the science and education uh, ed editor for the magazine Fair Chase. He was awarded the Bird, uh, George Bird Grinnell Award for Lifetime Achievement and Conservation from the Wildlife Management Institute in 2014, the Merits of Service Award for the Department of Interior in 2018, and the Aldo Leopold Award from the Wildlife Society in 2020. John is also one of the architects of the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. I've had the great privilege of getting to know John through the Wildlife Society and and conservation leaders for tomorrow. And I consider John a friend and, and colleague. Um, I could go on, but uh, I don't wanna take any more of his time. So with that, I welcome Dr. John Organ, who will be speaking with us today about the North American model of wildlife conservation, origins, meanings, and purpose. John, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And before I start, I'm going to see if I can navigate the technology here and share screen with you folks. So, Perfect, John, looks good. All right, are you seeing the full slide? Full slide, yep. Excellent. <laughs> well, good afternoon and, and thank you all for having me spend some time with you today. My good friend, Scott, asked me if I would give a talk in the North American model of, of wildlife conservation. Since uh, the time when Val Geist, Shane Mahoney, and I first published the, the 
first definitive paper on this concept 20 years ago, my experience has been that if, if you ask 10 different wildlife professionals what the North American model of wildlife conservation is, you will get 10 different answers. That's why I chose today to talk about the origins, the meaning, and the purpose of the North American model. Oops. Why isn't that? Let me see if this will work. Ah, I've got my first technical issue here. Let me see if this. Ah, there we go. Uh, I had to find the right button to push to advance the slides. Uh, zoom. Well, the North American model of wildlife conservation is, is a concept that was first articulated by Dr. Valerius Geist, who's a professor emeritus of environmental science at the University of Calgary, and quite frankly, one of the most eminent wildlife biologists in the history of our short profession. Geist was born in Eastern Europe and lived under two different totalitarian regimes before emigrating to Canada as a young man. His PhD research on, on mountain sheep at the University of British Columbia under Ian mctaggart Cowan resulted in a classic book that won the Wildlife Society's Book Award of the Year in 1971. Having experienced how wildlife issues were governed under different regimes around the world, he observed that the United States and Canada had legal and policy initiatives that in combination made wildlife conservation in North America unique. He began to articulate these principles or tenets, calling them a model or example. In collaboration with Shane Mahoney and myself, seven legal and policy tenets were first published in 2001 as a North American model of wildlife conservation. The references I've listed here are the ones that I believe are, are really the critical resources for those interested in fully understanding the basis for the North American model of wildlife conservation. The one at the top is from the Boone and Crockett Club's 2018 tome on North American wildlife policy and law. And I highly recommend that entire volume. And I, even though I'm obviously biased, I think that chapter is as definitive a treatment of the model as, as has been presented. Uh, these bullets represent what I believe are the key premises that are related to the North American model. And these are that as, as wildlife conservation emerged in North America, a distinct form developed. And that emergence really began in the mid 19th century. The seven components, tenets or principles are not all unique to North America, but their collective association is. And the North American model is not prescriptive like a, a scientific or statistical model. The term model here is really intended to mean example. And its purpose is not to outline every conservation strategy and mechanistic approach, but only to highlight those legal and policy underpinnings, and I really emphasize legal and policy, that collectively make North American conservation unique. Now at this point, it's important to articulate certain precepts that underlie North American wildlife conservation. Wildlife has value when it's alive. The uncontrolled use of wildlife leading to decline in extinction is unacceptable. Wildlife is a public resource and the responsibility of government is to conserve for current and future generations. And some wildlife can be perpetuated with sustainable use. Now, sustainable use is a principle that is recognized globally and sanctioned by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. But for sustainable use to be accepted in contemporary society, it must adhere to certain principles. These three have been articulated previously. And that's that the use must serve a practical purpose 
and that the species or population being utilized is not threatened or endangered. And if that use requires take, that method of take is considered acceptable. So these are the seven tenets of the North American model of wildlife conservation. I'll describe each in greater detail, but it's important to note that these are not intended to represent the entire suite of conservation approaches in North America. These represent those with broad-based underlying legal and policy foundations that collectively make North American wildlife conservation unique and distinct from other forms worldwide. The model is not game-centric or focused on hunting, but these tenets have each been applied more so to game species, principally because that's where the bulk of conservation funding has been directed towards. Recently, greater emphasis has been placed on applying these principles to other taxa such as herpetofauna. I believe an achievement of this century will be application as appropriate of these principles to all taxa. Well, the first tenet is really the keystone. Wildlife is a public trust resource. The public trust doctrine is in fact, a US Supreme Court ruling that was issued in 1842. The case that came before Chief Justice Roger Taney, Martin versus Waddell, involved the landowner's claim to rights over oyster beds near the waterline of his property on the Raritan River in New Jersey. The landowner claimed exclusive right to the fishery based on the grant of land to his ancestors in the 1660s by King Charles II of England. In researching the legal basis for such a claim, Tawney went back to the Magna Carta to see whether the king had the power to convey such a right. The Magna Carta in turn had drawn from ancient Roman law first articulated in the second century AD under the Emperor Gaius and first written in the sixth century under Emperor Justinian. Many scholars believe the concept of uh, ownerless things such as wild animals dates back to ancient Greek Hellenic law. Indeed, it's in my opinion anyway, it's likely that the first humans held the notion that wild things could be owned by no one. What Tawney discovered is that under English common law, there are special kinds of property. And the English disdained the concept of ownerless things. So these special kinds of property were held in trust by the king for the benefit of his subjects, not for his personal use. The king in this sense is a trustee, owning property for others and having special responsibilities that come with such trust. Now the ancient Romans did not define who the trustee was, but the English conveyed this responsibility of the king. Now much of the current United States, particularly in the West, was derived from Spanish land grants. So it's useful to see how ownership of, of wild resources were, were addressed by the Spaniards. If you look back at, at the origins of Spanish and Mexican land grants, uh, they placed ownership of wild resources in the trusteeship of the territorial governor. In America, the 13 original colonies were under English law and the king was trustee. After independence, there was no king and trusteeship was not defined. Chief Justice Taney, a staunch states' rights advocate, placed trusteeship in the individual states in his landmark decision in, in Martin versus Waddell. And this, of course, has become known as the public trust doctrine. In so doing, he declined the landowner's claim to exclusive rights to the oyster fishery. Taney added a caveat, though, he stated that the federal government could exert ownership if the constitution provided such powers. Three clauses of the US constitution allow for federal trusteeship of wildlife resources. 
the Commerce Clause, the Property Clause, and the Supremacy Clause. The Commerce Clause gives the federal government authority to regulate interstate commerce and is the legal foundation for the Lacey Act, the most important anti-poaching law in the United States. It also provides legal authority in part for the Endangered Species Act. The Property Clause gives the federal government ownership of resources on federal lands. This clause is broadly written and arbitrarily written and federal authority over wildlife on federal lands continues to be contested by many states. The Supremacy Clause mandates that federal treaties are supreme law of the land. The 1916 Migratory Bird Treaty between the United States and Great Britain on behalf of Canada became the constitutional grounding for the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This federal authority was contested in a 1920 Supreme Court case titled Missouri versus Ray P. Holland. Ray P. Holland was a federal game warden who arrested the Attorney General of Missouri for hunting waterfowl outside of the federal season framework. This test case affirmed federal authority over migratory birds vis-a-vis -vis the 1916 Treaty and the Supremacy Clause. Likewise, the treaty known as CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, provided constitutional basis for the Endangered Species Act. Chief Justice Taney, in his decision, did not explicitly address wildlife, but it was assumed the broad language encompassed it. A subsequent Supreme Court decision in 1896 in the case Gear versus Connecticut explicitly placed wildlife in the public trust. Today, public ownership of wildlife is entrusted to state fish and wildlife agencies as trust managers with limited federal ownership managed by agencies such as the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. The preeminent scholar of the public trust doctrine, Joseph Sachs, outlines certain conditions that must be held true for the public trust to be viable. Under trust law, trust resources must be considered property. It is noteworthy that animal rights ideology rejects the notion of animals as property. And it begs the question that if animal rights became law, would public ownership and by default, the government's ability to regulate and protect wildlife have no legal foundation. Trust resources must be available for general use of the public, unless conserving the corpus of the trust requires restrictions. And the notion of public trust applies to traditional uses such as recreation and, and fisheries. It also applies to what Sachs defined as natural uses that are peculiar to that resource. Hunting game, for example, could be construed as such a natural use. Sachs stated that the free avail availability of such natural uses defined a civilization as one of citizens rather than serfs. Further scholarship has suggested that certain other conditions must prevail in order for the public trust to be viable. The public needs to be aware of their rights and they must be able to enforce it against mismanagement by the government. Also, it must be consistent with contemporary concerns. The ancient Romans likely could have appreciated my colleague and TWS past president, John McDonald's desire to legally pursue and take a white tailed buck in the photo. They may not have comprehended our concern to protect the endangered carnival butterfly. The public trust doctrine has not held up as an impenetrable fortress in case law. In some instances, the courts have ruled in favor of general public interest, such as economic concerns, and not recognized the greater obligation that comes with trusteeship. It raises a concern as to whether the public trust doctrine is indeed a judicially enforceable right. Some of the challenges we observe to public ownership of wildlife include inappropriate claims of ownership, such as deer behind high fences, unregulated sale of live wildlife as is rampant with reptiles, 
difficulties in access to public resources, largely due to private property rights and, and access fees. As mentioned earlier, a value system endorsing animal rights that could theoretically remove their status as property and therefore trust resources. The second tenet is the elimination of markets for gain. This represented one of the earliest crusades in the ancestral wildlife conservation movement of the mid 19th century. The New York Association for the Protection of Game, co-founded by Theodore Roosevelt's uncle, Robert, made it its primary duty to pass local laws prohibiting the sale of game and making citizen arrests for violations. Members of Boone and Crockett Club, particularly co-founder George Bird Grinnell, waged a blistering campaign against market hunting and were responsible for the passage of the Lacey Act. What Garrett Harding would later term the tragedy of the commons was in full force as unregulated hunting of game for markets was rapidly depleting wildlife. When markets placed value on dead wildlife, dead wildlife was produced. Sport hunting or hunting under conditions of fair play, termed fair chase, placed value on wildlife when alive. And the belief was that it would produce live wildlife. Fur bearers not considered game at the time were still trapped for the fur market but restrictions on trap devices and imposition of seasons and bag limits regulated the take, which was considered beneficial in reducing conflicts with humans. However, until recently, there's been little legal restrictions for markets on certain other taxes, such as reptiles. As this internet advertisement indicates, shopping for turtles is easy. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates of the number of turtles exported from the United States during a five year period in the late 2000s were in the billions. Agencies and conservation organizations, mindful of the success of the elimination of markets for game, have been tightening regulations to restrict what appears to be an unsustainable market. Concern has also been raised over certain commercial contests for, say, shooting the largest coyote or some similar effort. Does this represent a market approach? These contests, I think as many of, of you are aware, have received much criticism in public discourse. In recent years, some have advocated highly regulated markets as a way to control overabundant game species such as white-tailed deer in some urban suburban settings. In fact, the opening of markets for the meat and hides of American alligators was critical in restoring the population and removing it from the endangered species list. Establishing highly regulated markets for game in certain areas could potentially reduce conflicts. It could also cultivate an appreciation for all hunters. And ready access to local healthy meat by non-hunters could foster an appreciation for animals they view as pests. However, this is a slippery slope. In any effort to open up markets for game, must have a preeminent and overriding conservation purpose and be considered as a last resort. The third tenet is allocation of wildlife by law. This represents the fact that wildlife in the United States and Canada is not allocated based on markets, birthright, land ownership, or other special privilege. Enactment of laws pertaining to wildlife is a process that's open to public discourse. Concern has been raised that even though we have many laws and regulations pertaining to wildlife, court imposed penalties for violators don't often measure to the crime, as judges who deal regularly with crimes against other humans may tend to devalue wildlife in comparison. Protections enacted by law for the benefit of wildlife may be negated by land use decisions that aren't under the jurisdiction of wildlife agencies, thereby negating the impact of such protections. The fourth tenet is that wildlife can only be killed for legitimate purpose. For hunting and trapping, laws define what species and under what conditions wildlife can be taken. Wanton waste laws in many states require hunters to utilize the meat. For most other wildlife, Laws or regulations specify when and where and what permissions apply 
to the killing of wildlife. Typically, this involves self-defense and property protection, and more recently, culling for the purpose of disease control, as is in uh, chronic wasting disease, for example. In some cases, we have seen activities that on their face violate this tenet. Examples include rattlesnake roundups and long range rifle shooting with prairie dogs as targets. It's difficult to identify a conservation purpose aligned with these activities. In recent years, we've seen a reduction in sanctioning of rattlesnake roundups, and I think this bodes well for the conservation of these species. The fifth tenet is wildlife is considered an international resource. Grounded in international treaty, this tenet recognizes that wildlife can transcend borders and one nation's actions can impact the other's resources. Examples include the Migratory Bird Treaty of 1916, championed by Canadian C. Gordon Hewitt, among others, and CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Current issues germane to this tenet include climate change, where international cooperation will be essential in facilitating adaptive strategies of species impacted where range shifts across borders may occur. Border walls may threaten the viability of populations of certain species whose range periphery crosses a border, essentially isolating population segments and subjecting them to reduced gene flow and lowered viability. The sixth tenet is science is the proper tool for discharging wildlife policy. Aldo Leopold articulated this tenet in his classic textbook, Game Management, published in 1933, which no doubt is familiar to everyone in Wisconsin. He referenced this as part of what he termed the Roosevelt Doctrine, reflecting the impact President Theodore Roosevelt had on wildlife conservation. All who have been involved in developing policy recognizing, recognize that science is not the only one factor that goes into policy decision making. Policy development is part of the political process and involves consideration of public input, economics, pragmatics, and other factors. The challenge we face today is ensuring that science does, in fact, play a role in decision making. However, the thrust of this tenet is that once policy has been established, wildlife professionals will implement, that is discharge, it using the best available science. That science should incorporate both ecological and social sciences. Social science and wildlife policy has become increasingly important as changes in society have rejected, in many cases, the expert authority model that the wildlife profession was founded on. The model's operating premise is that trained technical elites know what is best for society. Bernard Furneaux and Gifford Pinchot, both disciples of the Prussian forestry system, were weaned on this concept. Social differentiation in the 1960s and the rise of the cult of the individual, as sociologists term it, demanded a stronger public voice in decision making. The advent of the discipline of human dimensions of wildlife and its role in providing knowledge to decision makers as to attitudes, basic beliefs, and needs of the beneficiaries of the public trust promise to achieve more durable science-informed decisions in the future. The seventh and final tenet is democracy of hunting. Recall that the purpose of the North American model is to identify those key legal and policy initiatives that collectively distinguish wildlife conservation in the United States and Canada from other forms worldwide. Both Theodore Roosevelt and Aldo Leopold wrote that, quote, democracy of sport, where every citizen had the privilege to hunt, distinguished wildlife conservation in America from that in Europe. Current challenges to this tenet include reduced access to land, an increase in fee-based hunting that may favor the wealthy, and shrinking societal support for hunting. I'd like to turn now to some of the broader issues and criticisms 
of the model. Many have criticized the model as being hunting centric and merely an effort to justify hunting. In fact, all the tenets except the last one are much broader than hunting. The reality is that application of these tenets has largely been focused on game species because the full bulk of conservation funding at the state level has been generated by hunters. As we meet here today, legislative efforts are underway that would provide broad-based funding that would greatly enhance the ability of wildlife trustees to apply these tenets to all taxa. And I'm referring, of course, to the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. It's worth revisiting the topic of wildlife markets. It has generated much discussion. Scott and I have had many discussions over this issue. As stated earlier, there are potential positive outcomes of highly regulated markets for game meat. However, markets really should remain the exception and be warranted only where there is a true conservation benefit that otherwise could not be achieved. Many have criticized the model for being mute on habitat conservation initiatives. The model's tenets reflect principles enacted into law or policy. And to date, there are no overarching legal measures for wildlife habitat protection. There are many piecemeal efforts at the state and national levels, but no consistent policy that governs land use. Aldo Leopold stated that we will not truly achieve conservation until destructive uses of the land are punished by social ostracism. We're a long way from uh, realizing Leopold's vision, I'm afraid. Again, many have criticized the model for perceived focus on game. As mentioned, funding has restricted state-based application and initiatives to secure broad-based funding should result in greater tax inclusivity. Additionally, many of the strongest advocates for wildlife conservation have come directly from the hunting community. Hopefully, the same vested interest hunters have shown historically in wildlife conservation will grow among the non-hunting public and result in broad support for funding. While not a criticism of the model per se, many have criticized how wildlife are governed in states. Most states have a politically appointed board or commission to oversee wildlife conservation. Power and authority varies among states. But these bodies are in effect the trustees whose responsibilities are to ensure the conservation of wildlife for the benefit of current and future generations. If actions of trustees are focused purely on the roughly 6% of Americans and Canadians who hunt, then our conservation institution will lose relevancy with the broader public. In 2016, Governance principles for wildlife conservation in the 21st century were published. And there's a, a link on the slide. Adoption of these principles would greatly enhance relevancy and help to ensure the future integrity of what the model's principles represent. Moving forward, I believe it is fruitless to vote energy to revisiting or revising the model. It is a concept after all, not a dictate. It's not law. The principles that are embodied in it, many are, are embedded in law, many in broad-based policy. I firmly believe that our best use of our collective energies are in seeking legal and policy initiatives that will help us meet the emerging threats to wildlife conservation. I think that's the path forward for the future. And that's really where we should be focusing our collective efforts. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your uh, participation 
today and uh, for hanging in there through this presentation. And if there's time, I'd certainly be glad to address any questions. Thank you, John. Yes, we certainly do have some time. It's I have three four uh, 4.36 at this point. And uh, we do have some questions that have come up in the chat room. And, and by this, I'll just encourage people to uh, continue uh, dropping questions into the chat and uh, we'll cover as many as we can within a reasonable amount of time. Um, the first one is from Adrian Weidman. Uh, the historical discussion says nothing about the influence of Native Americans on public trust, but seems like my, my screen just changed. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. But seems like cultural use of wildlife by Native Americans was very different than European attitudes and more similar to concept of public trust consideration. Did Native Americans not have some impact on the North American model? Well, hi, Adrian. It's been a long time. And it's nice, nice to hear from you. Uh, you know, I, I honestly don't know to what extent Native Americans influenced, for example, the public trust doctrine. My sense is that in the mid 19th century, uh, Judge Robert Tawney, for example, who is actually quite infamous, uh, probably had no interest in Native American rights or principles. And that, I think in North American law and policy has been a major vacancy. Uh, I think that what many of the, certainly the pioneers in North America, uh, you know, their experiences, they probably learned an enormous amount from Native Americans. And I think we can still uh, learn a tremendous amount from traditional ecological knowledge. And that may be one of the uh, further achievements in North American conservation to better incorporate traditional ecological knowledge in our thinking and in our policies and in our law. And just a note on, on Roger Tawney, uh, the author of the Public Trust Doctrine, he was also uh, the key Supreme Court justice involved in the Dred Scott decision that led us to the Civil War. And he was despised by Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt's three heroes were George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and John Marshall. And John Marshall preceded Roger Tawney as the uh, as Supreme Court justice and whereas uh, Tawney was the state's rights advocate, Marshall was instrumental in the crafting of the Constitution. And through his tenure of uh, roughly 36 years in the Supreme Court, he pretty much defined the Constitution's role. Okay, so if it's all right, um, move on to the, the next question here. So it looks like, uh, so do rewards extending to hunters and landowners for taking CWD positive deer violate any of the tenants of the North American model? Uh, and this person says that they don't see any direct conflict. So again, could you read the first part of that again? Sure. Is, is there a conflict? Is, is that the question? Yeah, is there is there a conflict? Uh, or it says like, do the, do the rewards extending to hunters and landowners for taking CWD positive deer violate any of the tenants of the North American model? I don't think it compromises any of those principles because there's a conservation purpose behind it. In other words, it, it, you know, the question would be, is it a legitimate use? And if, if uh, culling white-tailed deer uh, to, uh, to contain chronic wasting disease is necessary to uh, maintain the viability of white-tailed deer population in a given state, then that to me is a legitimate conservation purpose. All right, I'll pick up the next one. Uh, since the first draft of the North American model, do you still feel the North American model serves the same purpose 
at the same integrity um, that you intended 20 years ago. And the second component, additionally recognizing that the uh, model is a model. Do you foresee any revisions, clarifications in the future as the wildlife management field advances? Well, I do feel that it served, it has served its initial purpose, which was to uh, look back retrospectively at what were the major broad-based legal and policy underpinnings that distinguished wildlife conservation in North America from other forms worldwide. And the utility of that, in my opinion, is that it, it helps us understand how we got to where we are. It's not intended to be a prescription and it's not intended to confine our thinking. It's purely a way to understand what are the key things that make conservation in the United States and Canada unique. It also helps us when we consider uh, actions as to whether they might compromise the, the historic foundation. And in terms of moving forward, uh, I personally don't see any value in rewriting or revisiting this, so I, you know, as because of the purposes that I've outlined, but there are many uh, interests that would like to do that and probably are going to do that. And I guess, as I stated in my conclusion, I think, you know, it's best to leave the model lie as a retrospective look at what made conservation in North America unique up to this point and focus on what we need to do, what laws we need to pursue, what broad-based policies we need to pursue to address the vexing issues that are facing us today. Thank you. Um, do you think, uh, would you mind, could you speak about how Val, Shane, and you cooked up the and the, the model? Uh, was it a long, slow simmer or a pot boiling over that led you to the paper published in the North American? Uh, I've, I've traced the history of the development of this in the chapter that I wrote for the Boone and Crockett publication. Uh, and essentially, Geist started to, to talk about the uniqueness of North American conservation in kind of a celebratory uh, tone and as well as, you know, in some policy writings. And initially he may have identified one or two of these principles as he called them at the time. And then, and this started probably in the 1980s. And then he would add one or two more. And uh, it's probably around the mid 1990s Shane and I uh, started to, uh, you know, work on this concept. And he and I traveled around the United States, probably interacting with somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 individual states with state, and federal, and non-governmental uh, wildlifers. Uh, putting on workshops that um, the premise was to identify what got us to where we are today, uh, what is missing, what do we need for the future, and what can we let go of in order to focus on implementing uh, policies for the future. We did that from I think about 1996 to 2001 or so. So a period of about five years. And one of the criticisms that we received was that, well, where is this model? We haven't seen it written down. And Shane and Val and I were together at the Premier's Symposium on Hunting Heritage in Ottawa, Canada in the year 2000. And at that point, there were roughly about six principles that were put together. And Shane and I were asked to co-sponsor or to put together the first full day symposium or special session at the 2001 North American Wildlife and Natural Resources Conference on uh, a particular topic called why hunt. Uh, 
And I looked at that as an opportunity to put the model in writing. And quite frankly, that's why that paper, the Geis Mahoney Oregon paper, uh, is titled, Why Hunting Has Defined the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. And that was probably a mistake because forever since the model has been tied to purely hunting, but it was a way to get it into the session. And that was my strategy. And I added that seventh principle of democracy of hunting. And that was again, based on my readings of Leopold and uh, Roosevelt, where they talked explicitly of, of that dif uh, distinguishing North American wildlife conservation from some of these systems in Europe. So that's kind of how it came together. It came together over a number of years, but that that initial publication was really a almost an 11th hour effort. And then of course it's been, uh, you know, that, that basic foundation is, is held, uh, but we've elaborated on it over time. Very good. Uh, a question, uh, what are your thoughts on what appears to be a shift from science-based management to legislative slash political, politically driven management as seen in the last wolf hunt in Wisconsin, in my opinion, in quotes, are the ways to prevent this? Is it our responsibility to educate politicians on the North American model of wildlife conservation? Well, I, I think that this trend as exemplified uh, in you know, the legislative actions you've described regarding wolves is, is uh, disastrous, quite frankly. Um, you know, as I stated, you know, science is the, isn't the only thing that goes into policy making, but oftentimes it's absent. And that's probably a good example uh, of what's been described. And uh, the way to, I think the way to prevent that is to have adoption of the governance principles that were in the uh, conservation letters paper that I cited from 2016 that, um, you know, Dan Decker, uh, Chris Smith, uh, Ann Forstrom, myself and others put forward, because I think that lays out the process whereby trustees are responsible and integrate both ecological and social science in decision making. So our challenge is to uh, do our job in, in not only uh, going out with the proper level of inquiry to build the science, but in communicating that. And I think a major challenge that we have, maybe the great, one of the greatest challenges that I foresee it's the fact that when you look at wildlife conservation writ large, it has not been on the national political agenda. The first, I was born in 1954, the, the very first presidential election that I recollect was 1960, the Kennedy-Nixon election. And being from Massachusetts, of course, it was quite thrilling to have John F. Kennedy uh, come forward as president. But from that election forward, I have not seen wildlife conservation firmly in any political platform. Yet wildlife, I believe, are important to all Americans. The major companies, at least their marketing departments, know this. You go to a, you go to a, a major city, you go into Times Square, look at the jumbotrons. Wildlife iconography is everywhere. It's imagery. How many car manufacturers use wild animals as names of their vehicles? What is it? We don't understand that. We need, it's not in our wheelhouse to do that kind of uh, research or science, but we need to be looking into that and supporting that so that we can understand that and build our messages to create a greater public awareness and appreciation so that our science gets into the media it gets into the into uh, popular society and has impact and force. 
Um, okay, so moving along, uh, says many states have made hunting a constitutional state right. What are your thoughts on this change and how it relates to the model? Well, I, I don't know that it, it has uh, a, it certainly I don't think conflicts with the model um, and, or any of the principles that are embedded in the model. Uh, it, it may be an extension of, of uh, public trust principles in some regard, uh, but uh, you know the. I think you know the the purposes of of those initiatives to have become a constitutional right is obviously to prevent ballot initiatives or direct democracy or some other legislative actions to um, greatly restrict or eliminate hunting. Uh, so it, in, in many respects, I think it's just separate and distinct from the model itself. It, it doesn't conflict because, uh, you know, the allocation of wildlife, you know, through hunting is still legislated. It's still in law. It doesn't mean that there's an open season or that there's special privileges associated with it. I see we're we're approaching five o'clock, but I think we reached a high of 138 participants. We still have 114 people hanging on to your every word, John. And so if you don't mind, I, I think we can continue on with some questioning. We, we still have other questions. Oh, yeah. you go. Um, <clears throat> this one, uh, animal rights organizations have been instigated a political hijacking of the wildlife management field. They are taking the science out of policy. Do you think the North American model can withstand this attack? Well, I, I don't know that, you know, that the model is an, an edifice and it's not something that can be really torn down. I think the larger question is uh, the, uh, the integration of animal rights thinking into wildlife conservation policy. What, what's its impact going to be on the future? And you know, there's there's obviously a, a big difference between animal rights ideology and animal welfare principles, and I hope that all of us are 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 strongly supportive of animal welfare principles. You know, animal rights is is an ideology and it's a belief system, and uh, you know people are entitled to their beliefs, but you know public policy, uh, you know, has to be clear and it has to reflect what the implications of such policies are and what its impact on, on people and the environment is going to be. Uh, so I think, you know, the, and if you look at, um, you know, studies have been done of, of the animal rights movement show that, you know, those that, that are the membership of say a given animal rights organization like uh, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, for example, uh, you might have, you have kind of a pyramid where, you know, at the top, you have the real ideologues, at, you know, at maybe the top, you know, 5% or so. And probably at the bottom, we are the folks that send in their, you know, 25 bucks a year or whatever, uh, and, and, you know, get the newsletters and such. Um, they're swayed really by animal welfare uh, beliefs. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the great scholars in the animal rights movement, Gary Francione, who was head of the animal rights legal uh, studies program at Rutgers, uh, he, he has a term for this. Uh, he wrote a really interesting book called Rain Without Thunder. And it was about the ideology of the animal rights movement. This wrote this back in the 90s, late 90s, I believe. And, uh, he was very much against these, you know, short-term animal welfare initiatives as a long-term means to gain animal rights. And he called for a dissolution of the major animal rights organizations like HSUS and PETA, uh, Fund for Animals, which was, you know, viable at the time, 
uh, saying that they needed to go back to the grassroots because mm -hmm. these groups have become so big and like, you know, any social movement, they splinter and they have their own um, uh, focus, much like the hunting groups, you know, splintering into, you know, wild turkey, pheasants, uh, you know, woodcock, grouse, elk, whatever. And, but he thought that this, this was uh, bad for the animal rights movement because they were willing to make compromises because he believed the animal welfare was in opposition to animal rights because it, it sanctions use of animals. And so uh, he saw the, you know, really the decline of the animal rights movement. And, and again, said that, you know, we really need to grow, go back to the grassroots. And it reminded me of one of my favorite sayings by Theodore Roosevelt, uh, that the pests of democracy feed most freely at the grassroots. And that, of course, Roosevelt was believed in a strong national government. But anyway, I, I don't, I, I think that globally, we, you know, Shane Mahoney has talked about this a lot. There's an increasing movement of empathy towards wildlife. And, uh, and I don't see a problem with that as long as, uh, because I think we all empathize to the fate of wildlife. We all appreciate wild animals. We revel in their beauty, their wildness. And, uh, but we have, I think, I hope that this increased movement of empathy towards wildlife recognizes that, that there are people whose identity and their livelihoods are really tied to nature and the use of animals. And as long as that use adheres to sustainable principles, that it should be allowed. Very interesting. Thank you for addressing that. Um, so it seems like the tenet of democracy of hunting should also address should also address for species not previously hunted or not hunted for many decades, that there be a democratic process for deciding when and how species will be hunted. Should the democracy of hunting not also include a democratic pro include de <clears throat> excuse me, democratic processes in deciding if a species should be hunted? Well, I think that's covered in, in the tenet of allocation by law. Because that's really where those, you know, it's in that rubric, that's where those decisions are made. And so if, if you have uh, a given species that is determined by science and policy that could be, that can be hunted and regulations are enacted for that, then really what all the principle of democracy of hunting says is that it, it shouldn't be restricted to say the um, favored few that all should have an equal opportunity, even if that's restricted. You know, for example, the very first modern day moose hunt, legal moose hunt in Vermont that was initiated in the 1990s, first hunt was restricted to 30 permits. But those 30 permits weren't given to the governor's, you know, buddies. Uh, you know, it was, it was a democratic process or say an open process where everyone had the opportunity to apply for those. Here's another question about opportunity, kind of a follow-up. And uh, you may think that it comes from someone from an organization that uh, has gained recent traction back to country, um, hunters and anglers. Um, question is, how do you feel about wealthy Western landowners purchasing key parcels with crucial access roads to large land areas, guaranteeing, guaranteeing that they and their buddies alone get the trophy elk and other big game species in, in that region, locking out uh, other less affluent hunters. Well, unfortunately, I think that's just the reality of private lands law. And that's, you know, the, um, the, I guess, unfortunate, if you look at it that way, uh, reality is, is, is that uh, 
um, the, the, the scope of authorities and responsibilities of state wildlife agencies and the trustees of the wildlife resource do not uh, em encompass private property rights. So private property rights in court are, are most likely going to be supreme. And, but you know, those private property owners do not own those wildlife that's on their land. They may control the access by virtue of their property rights. And that is unfortunate because uh, it's, you know, denies, you know, the average individual, you know, op of opportunity. Uh, and, you know, some of the concerns that have been raised over, uh, over tying up large, uh, large acres and hectares of land for uh, private use of the wildlife resource is that in some instances, certainly not all, but in some instances, they, um, they will be managed purely for, let's say, trophy animals at the expense of biodiversity. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure, I, you know, I know that there are, you know, opposite examples where you have land that's, that's off limit, that's tied up, but, you know, it's done for conservation purposes. And, uh, and so that, you know, is going to have a benefit to biodiversity, likely in the long run. It's just the, you know, the, the principle of public ownership does get compromised be because the public that say want to hunt or want to view or otherwise uh, have those wildlife be a part of their life are denied of that. But I don't think there's anything that in, in, the, in our current toolbox that, that can really address that with the exception of incentives for landowners. And that's where I think, you know, moving to the future that we need to look closely at some of these kinds of issues and how can we ensure not only the uh, conservation of lands uh, through strong broad-based legal and policy initiatives, but also access, uh, responsible access to those lands. So it looks like we have two more questions. Um, sorry, let me get my bearings here. Okay, so um, kind of following up on the, the animal rights uh, question, uh, trapping is under fire by animal rights groups in several states, and part of the argument is that it violates the North American model. Can you speak to your thoughts on how trapping fits in the model? Yeah, I certainly can, and I've, I've written extensively on this. Um, and, you know, one of the examples I use is a study that was done in the 1990s. And it was, a, it's in a, it was presented as a chapter in a book on exploitation of mammal populations. And the study looked at the good, the bad, and the ugly of animal exploitation. And they used three examples. One of them was ecotourism for spider monkeys in Costa Rica. Another one was fur trapping in, uh, in, a, in Alberta, I believe. And I forget what the third one was, but uh, so, you know, I could ask, what do you think their, their findings were? Well, you know, since we can't all raise our hands and talk here, I'll cut mm -hmm. to the chase. Uh, they found that the ecotourism program for spider monkeys in Costa Rica was unsustainable. It was bad because of the demand for ecotourism uh, required development of infrastructure, which was destroying wildlife habitat. It was actually destroying habitat for the spider monkeys so that it, it was an unsustainable practice. Whereas the fur trapping in Alberta the harvest levels were within what was considered to be the 
uh, normal range of population fluctuations of those, those fur bear species. But the rural people's and native people's advocacy for trapping as a part of their lifestyle, as a central life interest of theirs and their connection to the land was powerful enough to prevent uh, development, say energy development, mineral development, and other forms of land, ex land destructing. Uh, and so it was considered to be an example of the good. And this was, this, this study was done by uh, two researchers from the UK who I would say were relatively neutral or unbiased towards trapping. It wasn't as if they were trapping advocates. So uh, in terms of trapping and uh, let's say the, the tenet of elimination of markets for game, remember that the, that tenet was based upon the market hunting of the 19th century where meat uh, and other parts were being brought to market into the cities and the game populations were extremely vulnerable. Now, certainly in the early 18th century, during the peak of the fur trade and the expansion west, uh, fur bear populations were decim decimated by uh, unregulated trapping. But in the wake of that, uh, in the decline of trapping because of that, when trapping was resumed, it was under highly restrictive regulations and the tools were also restricted. And uh, a classic example is the state of Massachusetts. Beaver reintroduced them, to, well, beaver were eliminated from Massachusetts prior to the Revolutionary War. And during those intervening years, where did humans reside? Where did they start to build and develop? Along waterways. Uh, and beaver reintroduced themselves coming over from New York in 1928. And that first colony flooded out a farmer's field and road. So it was a, an immediate conflict. Uh, so eventually the state of Massachusetts had to make a decision. Were they gonna treat beaver as pests and eradicate them as a problem animals? Or were they going to allow legal regulated and restrictive trapping where trappers would pay for the privilege and there would be a legitimate use of those animals in terms of the meat, in terms of you know, the fur and the pelt trade. And where an animal control agent may not have uh, interest in the perpetuation of that resource per se, whereas the fur trapper would and would want to see those animals persist and thrive on the landscape, but through their actions would help to minimize human wildlife conflict. And the conservation purpose to the regulated fur trapping seasons and having those advocates for those resources that can often cause conflict, you know, such as beaver or through, you know, predation by carnivores and other things that, uh, as long as it's done sustainably and, uh, and there's a conservation purpose that would be fully consistent with the model. So it is uh, 10 after five right now. Um, so people are starting to kind of roll off because they probably have dinners to get to and other engagements. But uh, I do want to point out there are several thank yous that are coming up on the chat screen and appreciation for your, your time and, and questions. I like this one outstanding lecture, John, and the sophisticated questions only made this hour more awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. I see one last question and, and maybe Jennifer will probably just close it down after this. Um, this is rolling off of a previous question. Um, why do you believe we are seeing policy initiatives in Montana and Wyoming pushing to increase non-resident licensed fees and or require non-resident hunters to go through licensed outfitters? This may cause dis interest slash prohibit some non-residents from purchasing these licenses, thus decreasing the funding for these state agencies. I'm sure there is more behind the scenes um, at work and uh, reasoning, um, but I'm aware that I'm aware of, but I was curious to hear of your insights. Well, I, you know, I, I 
don't know that I have any real insights to this, but I'm certainly well aware of it. And I've been involved in many uh, threads on, on, you know, what's happening in, in Montana. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, a number of colleagues in Montana that are very close to the issue. Uh, so I'm going to just speculate here. And, and I think that, you know, the, the initiative for, you know, these legislations that are going to be providing more opportunity for, for guides at the expense of, of residents is economically driven. And you've got strong lobbying forces there. And I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the Montana legislature to know, you know, what kind of insider stuff may or may not be going on. Uh, but, you know, I don't see any, uh, any reason for such initiatives that would benefit the wildlife resource. And so I think the benefit is to, you know, uh, increasing possibly the number of non-resident hunters, uh, which is going to help the guides. It's probably, you know, certainly non-resident licenses are uh, in Montana um, are a whole lot more expensive than a resident license. Now, I don't really know, you know, who the key drivers are, but I, I suspect it is from the organized, you know, guide industry, and it's an economic uh, initiative. Well, very good, John. Um, we've taken plenty of your time, and I know other people have other things to do this evening, but uh, speaking for everyone, I certainly appreciate the time you put in with us. Um, the, the answering of these questions, the depth of your knowledge and breadth of your knowledge is really, really greatly appreciated and uh, quite outstanding. Really nice to have you here with us, John. Scott and Jennifer and to everyone who's participated, and I see a whole lot of my friends and colleagues mm -hmm. uh, that are popping up here. Uh, it's really been an honor to spend time with you. I thank you for inviting me. It, it's been fun, and I wish I was there in person so we could go out and have some Wisconsin beer and maybe some brats and, uh, and <laughs> some more. Maybe that'll happen down the road. It's the, only, it's the only reason we started the seminar series, but uh, you know we have to live with this COVID situation for a while longer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> say, say hi to my uh, my homeboys at the Wisconsin unit. Very good. Appreciate your time, John. Thanks. All right. Thanks everyone else too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.